on this morning's Big Phone-In. What do you think of the way the BBC has handled David Lowe? Veteran BBC local radio DJ David Lowe has lost his job after playing a song on his Golden Oldies show that contained the racist N-word. The 68-year-old broadcaster says he was totally unaware the 1932 version of The Sun Has Got His Hat On included the racist term. After playing the song, he received no complaints, but one loyal listener contacted him via social media to alert him to the error. David asked if he could go on air to apologise for the mistake, but the BBC management told him that he had to fall on his sword. The corporation now accepts that they made a mistake, and they've offered him his job back, but he says the situation has worsened his existing medical condition, and he's too sick to return. Last week, it was Jeremy Clarkson who was under fire for mumbling the N-word in this outtake from Top Gear that should have been left on the cutting room floor. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. So when he squeals, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Well, he immediately went online to apologise. I realised that in one of the mumbled versions, if you listen very carefully with the sound turned right up, it did appear that I'd actually used the word I was trying to obscure. David Lowe says that he was not given the chance to apologise to his listeners. So I've invited him onto my show this morning. He'll be live with me in just a second. We'll hear from him. And I want your reaction to this story as well. I'm quite sure many of you will have read about it in your papers this weekend. What do you think of the way the BBC has handled David Lowe? 08459 455 555. That's my telephone number. You can text me. 81333. Start your text with 3CR. Texts are charged at standard network rate. Email jvsshow at bbc.co.uk and you'll find me on Twitter if you want to tweet me. Twitter.com forward slash jvsshow. What do you think of the way the BBC has handled David Lowe? Have your say on today's big phone-in. Call 08459 455 555. That's 08459 455 555. The JVS Show. BBC Three Counties Radio. So let's speak to the man himself. Good morning to you, David Lowe. Good morning. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. So you have presented um, this particular programme for... It's not only BBC Radio Devon, it covers the the whole of the South West, doesn't it? Yes, uh, Devon, Cornwall, Channel Islands, Bristol, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire and Somerset. And how long have you presented that show? Uh, That show came into existence in uh, 2002. So quite some time. Yes. And... Is this the first mistake that you've ever made in your broadcasting career? Uh, I've made uh, lots of little silly errors on errors probably every broadcaster will admit to, but this is the first mistake of its kind that I've ever made in 32 years, six months. So effectively, I've carried a clean sheet with me right up to this time. So on this particular evening then, you played the 1932 version of the sun has got his hat on. Yes. Now, I wasn't aware, and seemingly you weren't aware when you decided to play that particular uh, version of the song, that it contains the N-word. That's right. A word that, of course, is a a disgusting word for anybody to use and should certainly never be broadcast uh, on the television or on the radio. Agreed. So, what happened when you played it? Did you realise that the word had gone out on air at the time, or was it something, were you concentrating on other things and, and actually it passed you by? Uh, no, in fact, the, the programme was pre-recorded, Jonathan, but uh, um, uh, while I'm, um, as you probably know yourself, uh, while that recording uh, was actually going out into the recording process, I was almost certainly queuing up the next CD, putting the one that's just played away and so on, so I'm not actually here hearing what's going into the recording process at that time. Um, and uh, like you, perhaps, I've heard that recording hundreds and hundreds of times over the years. I've even featured it on a number of occasions, um, uh, as recently as '09, in fact. Um, but I have never, ever heard that word in the line of lyrics. Um, needless to say, what happened was that as the programme was being transmitted, um, I was sitting in my studio at home online, and I just happened to go into Facebook. And while I was on Facebook, I got a, a private message from one of my listeners. It wasn't a complaint. 
he, he said to me, David, I don't know whether you realize it, but you've just played the 1932 version of Ambrose and the son has got his hat on. Did you know that contains the N-word? And of course, as soon as I saw that, my heart was in my mouth. Uh, I thank the listener concerned uh, for his heads up. Um, I immediately came offline, uh, got the recording out of my archive, put it on my CD player, put my headphones on and listened. And indeed, uh, when I listened to it, I heard the N-word and I was absolutely, well, um, horrified, shall we say. So what was your reaction then at that point? Did you alert the BBC management? No. Um, I, I, what I decided to do was because um, it was very late on the Sunday evening by that time, uh, what I decided to do was to wait until the following day. Now, the following day, the Monday, which was uh, April 28th, as per usual, I was in the extra studios to pre-record the following Sunday's programme. So as you can imagine, from the beginning of the following morning, right the way through to tea time um, uh, my my time was uh, at a premium I just didn't have an opportunity to make contact with anybody but in the back of my mind I was expecting to get um, uh, a complaint or some complaints about it and I thought perhaps on balance the best idea would be to uh, wait to contact the BBC um, uh, if any complaints came to light. Needless to say when I came home after my recording session on the 28th of April there was indeed um, a BBC uh, email um, alerting me to the fact that uh, they'd received an email from a listener who had um, complained about the recording and asked for me to be uh, dealt with appropriately. Right. So at that point, had the whole Jeremy Clarkson N-word affair hit the news headlines? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, it was about the same time, but I, I'm, I don't quite recall whether it was uh, the timing of it so you weren't aware of whether that that was all kind of in the news at the at the time i mean well, i would have thought you would have done because you would have thought oh my god this is the terrible timing yeah has it um has yeah that, that, now you mention it um uh, the, uh, with benefit of hindsight uh, yes now you mention it i do think uh, there was some uh, something in my mind which said well this is not a very clever time to bring this particular issue up no. Uh, so, uh, nevertheless, I, um, uh, I was, I'd been alerted to the problem, and I decided to just wait uh, for a few hours to see if the BBC got any plain, uh, complaints, which they did. And, um, but only the one? Uh, the, only the one that I know of, Jonathan. Right. There may, of course, have been others, but I have to stress here, I haven't had one single complaint uh, privately through post, email, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn... Uh, or indeed on my blog. So, when they alerted you to the fact there had been this one complaint, what was your what was your suspicion as to what would happen at that point? Did you think, my God, I'm going to lose my job, or did you think this is okay, or all we need to do is just apologise? It was a simple mistake. It wasn't something that I'd, I'd done on purpose, mm. and I'm sure the BBC will back me up and they will defend me to that particular listener. Well, my immediate reaction, I don't have my email reply in front of me, Jonathan, so I'm going to paraphrase here, but my immediate reaction was, what can I say? I'm dreadfully sorry, I'm deeply embarrassed by this, and uh, I then finished off that uh, email by saying, uh, actually, in question form, there was a question mark over this, this wasn't a statement of intent, this was a question mark, I said, uh, I guess this may be a good time to fall on my sword, question mark. Um, I then received an email from uh, the management to say, don't you check um, the recordings uh, that uh, you feature. My reply to that was, um, actually, I'm usually really sharp on this sort of thing, but hands up, I made a silly mistake. This one got through, and I'm very, very sorry. It was then that I said, look, as I see it, there are two options available to me here. Firstly, um, I, I'm perfectly happy to offer an unreserved apology to my listeners at the next available program, which in fact would have been yesterday, May the 11th. Um, alternatively, uh, I, 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 I may be required to fall on my sword. 
and uh, the over the next couple or three days there was a, a little another little exchange of emails the first one of which said um, we don't want you to mention mention anything about last week's program on air uh, which said to me um, the apology that I suggested which in fact I'd scripted in that earlier email um, uh, was being declined and uh, that was more or less it and I just sort of half expected what was coming next and indeed the following day I received an email uh, to say that regrettably uh, we feel that um, uh, we need to take your offer of falling on your sword to res uh, resolve this situation. Now when you received that email how did you feel? That, 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 uh, I mean, it, it, there's no words to express that, quite honestly. I was, um, I don't, I don't like the word gutted, but, um, uh, but I have to use it in that situation because I'd uh, uh, admitted to making a very, very silly mistake, and um, uh, the uh, result was that I'd offered to apologise or to fall on my sword, and the BBC had decided to go for the. Uh, latter option. Presumably, then, you didn't think they would. If you were so so gutted, presumably you, they took you by surprise. You thought that they would, they would have your back, to use another expression. In all honesty, I did expect them to come back and say, yes, we think it'll be a rather good idea to uh, make a, um, a, an apology to your listeners at the next available opportunity. And as I say, I'd already submitted a script to them for that apology. Uh, but unfortunately, they decided on the, uh, the latter option. Now, the other thing I felt at that time, uh, when I was told that uh, to resolve the situation, we, we regrettably require you to fall on your sword, immediately um, my sympathies um, uh, were with the many thousands of listeners, especially those who, uh, by the nature of my program, are elderly, live alone, and or suffer poor health, who through no fault of their own, um, were about to lose a weekly program they'd, come to, they'd take to the, taken to their hearts. That was um, a great sadness to me, and it still is. Um, I'm so, so sorry that uh, it happened in this way, but um, uh, I had no alternative but to uh, accept the decision that was made by the BBC management. Now, in, uh, in all fairness, I must say at this point, Jonathan, that subsequent to this, um, I did have a long conversation with the top boss at the BBC region, and um, he said to me that had he heard about this uh, episode earlier, um, he would have um, effectively asked me to do what I was hoping I was going to do, and that is apologise on air. Uh, he wouldn't have allowed it to have got this far. Well, didn't sh surely the manager that was dealing with it at the station, surely they are duty-bound to refer this type of complaint up? Um, one would have thought so, but um, I, I'm, now, it may be that um, uh, the, the boss in question who I spoke to on Saturday um, uh, may have been tied up or, or away, I don't know, but um, he, he told me that it wouldn't have got this far had he been made aware. In other words, that implies that he wasn't made aware. Um, so, but I'm, I'm not prejudging that, it's just a thought on my part. But what he did say, to give them fair dues fair, uh, fair do on this, um, he said to me that I want you back on air, I want you back in the studio. And I said to him, look, um, I really appreciate that uh, magnanimous gesture. Uh, I really do appreciate that, but as you can probably imagine, um, I'm, he knows that I'm partially disabled by dystonic tremor, which, because it's rooted in the central nervous system, uh, reacts very badly indeed to undue stress. Needless to say, uh, over the past couple of weeks, there's been a very sharp increase in my symptom severity, and uh, whether the tremor condition actually returns to its pre-Easter state remains to be seen. Now, can I just ask you, and this is very crucial, yeah. at the point when the, the more senior member of BBC Management said to you, I want you back in the studio, mm. had you made it clear that you were intending to make this, this situation public? I hadn't told anybody. Um, all, all, all I'd done at that point was um, I'd placed a, because I hadn't uh, been given the opportunity to 
um, uh, apologise on air at the next available opportunity. What I decided to do, because I still felt that I wanted an opportunity to say sorry to my listeners, to apologise profusely for what happened. It was a silly mistake to make. And as I say, the, the first kind of mistake, the um, first mistake of its kind I made in my 32-year career. What I did was, uh, I because um, I've had a blog associated with my program for uh, a, a year or so now, and so I decided to post a um, uh, an article on there uh, explaining to my listeners what had happened and apologizing profusely for the mistake I made. Now, um, uh, the, in doing that, um, it's, uh, I, I expected, quite honestly, because I know how, how things operate here. I know that the BBC have been keeping an eye on my Facebook pages, my blog, and so on and so forth. I know that's a fact. But they probably do the same with all of the other people connected with broadcasting. Um, I don't have a problem with that. What I did think was, well... I'll put this message up, and uh, we'll let it sit there. And I'm almost certain that uh, the, the powers that be will, someone will alert them to it. They'll be able to see it, and uh, maybe they'll react to it. So, and, and that was what happened. Well, that, yes, but not from them. Um, uh, the, the reaction I got was um, straight from uh, the the, pr uh, the uh, print press, uh, the the national press. And, um, you know, in all honesty, the past couple of days have been absolutely manic. And how do you react to that? Because, of course, it, it's no secret that the, the BBC is... I mean, it's a wonderful organisation, of course it is, and I'm sure even though you've had this experience, I would imagine you're, you're still a fan of the BBC. Um, I mean, you've, you've, you've made a living from the BBC for a, a long time, so... Um, well, am I right in, in saying that? I notice you're being very quiet when I make that, that comment. I'm used to interviewing people, Jonathan. I'm letting you finish what you what your question is well, before is, I interrupt. Is but, that uh, true? Uh, yes, it is. I, I have great respect for the BBC. Look, let me make this point abundantly clear. I don't have any arguments, any quarrels whatsoever with my former BBC colleagues. What I do have, however, are major issues with the system that they're trying to work with. I believe the system that's been put in place, not only in the BBC, um, is fundamentally flawed. And I think this has been exhibited by the way this has been handled. Unfortunately, because my colleagues uh, only had this fundamentally flawed system to work with, it, it's turned into a rather badly handled affair. That doesn't mean that I've lost any respect for or regard for the BBC. Far from it. The BBC is a, a wonderful organisation. But you must have realised that when you went public with this, when you put the, the details of this on your blog, you must have realised that that would be like a, like a red rag to a bull for a lot of the print press who despise the BBC and for a lot of those critics who are constantly waiting for an opportunity to run the BBC down and try and, try and diminish its reputation to the very people that pay for it. Uh, well, let's put it this way. I, um, when you put something on a blog, um, it's clear that uh, uh, various people are going to see it. Uh, my intention was to uh, apologize to my listeners um, uh, in a way that I would have liked to have done on air, but was uh, not allowed to do. Uh, the fact that um, it was picked up by the, uh, by the press um, is, uh, okay, it's history now, it's true. Um, I in all honesty, uh, didn't expect to um, have the kind of uh, reaction to this that has happened. Uh, so um, I'm not saying that it didn't cross my mind. What I am saying is that I didn't, in my wildest dreams, expect um, inspect this to have quite an impact. Obviously, the BBC has said to you, and they've, they've said publicly as well, that they recognise that this was perhaps very badly handled mm -hmm. from the outset, and they have offered you the opportunity to come back. Back, yep. But you've said that you, you don't want to come back because it's having an effect on, on your health. Um, do you stand by that or, or do you think you will change your mind? Well, at this moment of time, Jonathan, um, I, I stand by what I've said because um, l let me um, explain the situation in just a little more detail. Dystonia 
um, is the condition I suffer from. It's a neurological condition. It is not, I stress, not a stress-related condition as has appeared in the news. Uh, dystonia is a neurological condition like Parkinson's, um, uh, multiple cirrhosis, motor neuron disease. And it, it, it's rooted in the central nervous system. And uh, if you have a, um, a major health issue like flu, or if suddenly you're confronted by a, a great wave of, uh, of stress, as has happened to me over the past couple of, uh, couple of weeks, um, this will have a very big impact on the condition. That's what's happened to me. It's put me back quite a long way, and it's clearly going to take quite a long time for me to recoup. My specialist, however, has explained to me that when this happens, you never quite go back to the level of the condition that you were at before the episode occurred. So, as you can probably imagine, I've got my work cut out now to try and bring my health back on an even keel uh, as best I can. The condition I have affects my uh, hands, arms, and head um, really quite dramatically. Uh, so, uh, as you can imagine, an awful lot of the work that I do uh, relies on my dexterity. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, the version of The Sun Has Got His Hat On with the racist word that you played, yeah. it is available for use on the BBC's own desktop jukebox system that we broadcasters use to access archived material. That very same recording. Very same recording. Yes. I, um, I know there are other recordings of it, and I know later recordings of it, because that's pretty well the original. And uh, the, um, uh, the apparently, I've not heard them, but apparently the later recordings have substituted the, uh, the N-word for the word peanuts. Well, uh, uh, but I've not heard any of those versions. Well, I'm, I'm being I'm being told by my production team that 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 recording with that word is available on the BBC's very own desktop jukebox. Well, that that you know that perhaps backs up what I was saying about the fact that um, I was completely innocent of the fact that the N word appeared in that particular recording. The the other thing I was going to say, and it's it's all rather academic now, but I'm wondering whether it, it was something you raised with those BBC managers. There is something called mandatory referral now that has been around ever since uh, the Jonathan Ross um, and Russell Brand instance, where yeah. any pre-recorded programmes have to be listened to um, yeah. by by members of the management team. Yes, well... Now, ha yeah. had anybody been listening to your pre-recorded show and shouldn't they have protected you from this? Um, uh, that's a bit of a story, Jonathan, because um, every week after I finished uh, recording, I came back home to my studio and I went through the compliance process, which, as you probably know, takes quite some time uh, to fill out the compliance form. I did that every week after recording the program. I submitted in the normal way that particular program's compliance form, and when I visited the compliance form list on the Saturday, the day before the transmission was due, it was still pending. I then emailed uh, the uh, boss and said, look, um, I've just noticed that uh, tomorrow night's program is still pending. It hasn't been approved. His reply was, leave it with me. Um, and uh, much to my surprise, um, when I got home on the Monday, 28th of April, the first thing I saw was this email complaint from the BBC, and just out of curiosity, I went onto the compliance pages, and I regret to say that that programme was still pending. So do you think that anybody at the BBC, any member of management or anybody that should have complianced that particular programme, do you believe that they should now fall on their sword? Oh, no, come on. I, I think... I think that's um, uh, something that, first of all, I won't be drawn on. Um, it's not for me to say. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm an ex-freelance broadcaster, and uh, I know the situation. I know where I stand, and I know where I've stood all my broadcasting life, 32 years. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And uh, that's the end of the story. I'm in no position and don't wish to be in, in any position to, uh, to determine the future of anybody else's career. I've, I have my own to consider. One final quick question to you before I let you go, and I want to thank you so much for your time this morning. You're welcome. How important has this job been to you? 
Oh, well, uh, music and words, because I'm also an author, uh, a columnist, a writer, and so on. Uh, music and words have been part of my life for as long as I can remember. I love music, um, and my tastes are eclectic. You'd be surprised some of the tastes I do have, musically speaking. But over the years, I've, um, you know... Uh, had an accumulation of understanding and knowledge of music in particular, and also in particular the mid-20th century, which of course was the area that I focused on during uh, Swingers and Singers. Um, it's still very much part of my life, and it will always remain part of my life. In whatever form I'm uh, dealing with music and words, um, it will both will always remain part of my life. David? When you go out of broadcasting, you might as well go out with a bang, and you've certainly gone out with a bang. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. You're welcome, Jonathan. It's David Lowe.